Psalm 107. Open your Bibles to Psalm 107. I am going to keep believing that we are a life-giving church. We don't exist for ourselves. We exist for this community to be able to reach out to this community and connect people that are here. One of the great things about life, and David mentioned this, the only person that, that's going to change you is you. And the only thing you've got control over in a lot of circumstances is your attitude. Amen. And your attitude is so important. It's powerful. You, you know, you, listen, you are your attitude. You wear your attitude. I saw your attitude before I saw you this morning. Some people say, Pastor, you're opening the door for people, letting folk in. No, I'm checking the attitude as you're coming in. <laughs> I'm seeing what kind of service we're going to have today. Attitude creates your world and designs your destiny. It determines your success or failure in life. It all has to do with your attitude. It's more powerful than wealth. It's more powerful than beauty, title, or social status. It can make pretty people ugly. If you've got a bad attitude, it can make ugly people pretty. Somebody say, Pastor, I'm so ugly. Get your attitude right, and we'll think, we'll think you're pretty. Amen. We'll, we'll flip that around. It's the distinguishing factor between a winner and a loser. It's attitude. It's the mindset that determines our interpretation and response to our environments. It's our way of thinking. And if you change your thinking, I've preached this for years, stinking thinking is going to hurt you. But if you can change your thinking, you can change your life. Amen. Your attitude is an inward feeling expressed by behavior. Your behavior is going to come forth. So my goal this morning is to affect your attitude. I want to affect your attitude toward the love of God. And understand, when I say love of God, many people, it's like, oh, what, what, do you, what do you mean, love of God? I want to break this thing down that love heals, hopes, and helps. I said love heals, hopes, and helps. Say it with me. Love heals, hopes, and helps. Now, it works horizontally. It works between me and you. If we have love one toward another, as the Scripture says, love will heal, love gives hope, and love helps. But vertically is the first thing that's got to take place, that we have this understanding of the love of God. And it really jumps out in Psalm 107. Are you comfortable? Psalm 107. Now, I'm going to do some, some switch. I know some of you say, what Bible does he use? Somebody asked me last week on their way out, they said, Pastor, that message Bible, is that a good? I love the message Bible. Amen. I just say it just speaks my language. Now, I will go every now and then to a King James. Sometimes I'll go to a New International Version. Sometimes I'll use an American Standard. I, I use all kinds of, uh, you know, I'm just going to find what says the best to me. I want, it's the spirit of, everybody say the spirit of. I want the spirit of it to affect you. Many people get so religious about these and thous, they miss what God is trying to say to them. Amen. So it's important to find the spirit of it. And, and, and I'm not here to argue with you over this point, but this is the way I've always been. When I'm reading the Bible, I'm going to find something that speaks to me. If you speak Spanish in here and you have a Spanish Bible, you're probably closer to the original translation than anything we got in English. It's closer. It's, it's amazing. That's where I get the word hacienda instead of mansion on the hillside. It's a hacienda that God is going to give us. We're going to stay in. We're not going to stay in a mansion on the hillside. We're going to be a, God's got a great big house. Amen? Don't try to figure it out. Quit trying to figure it out. Quit trying to figure out if you're going to be on. It's a big house. Does it have floors? If it does, how we get there? You know, all these things, you, you quit wrestling with those things. <laughs> because if it's a big house and if it has floors, if you think, you know, 100 stories is tall, where do you get to heaven? You know, God, God may, get, may take this thing vertical instead of horizontal. It's his call. How many of you know you don't care? You don't care as long as you get there. You don't care. I don't care. I don't care how it works out. I just want to get there. Oh, everybody say, oh. Oh, thank God he's so good, exclamation point. His love never runs out. Again, out of the Message Bible. All of you set free by God, tell the world, testify about it. Tell how he freed you from oppression, depression, possession. Tell how he did it. Then, the bound, then bounded you up from all over the place, from the four winds, from the seven seas. That when God puts people together, he puts, and this, this is what's so powerful to me. Uh, God sees beyond our borders. I know we deal with our borders here in the States and stuff, but God sees beyond our borders. He sees the world. For God so loved the United States. For God so loved Mex. For God so loved. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. You got to start thinking more global. You got to realize this. So when God says, I called them in from the seven seas, from north, south, east, west, I'm bringing them in. That's what God does to the house of God. He brings all of us together and he shows us his loving kindness. Lord, I thank you for your word. 
I ask your blessing to abide upon us this morning. I ask God for the churches that we're connected with. They would be blessed. God, that there would be a, a, a literal anointing taking place that the preacher wasn't ready for and the people were received. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. It may be seated. One of the great things about the Bible, we are commissioned to share it. And it's good news. It's not bad news. It's good news. I know there's some things in it you read and go, well, that's kind of rough. But it's still good news. Amen. It's unique news, just, not just for forgiven, but forgotten sin. Not just healed diseases, but cured of the cause. Psalm 107 verse 4 says, Some wandered in desert wastelands, finding no way to a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. So 3,000 years ago, this gives us kind of a panoramic view of what was going on in the world. That there were people out there who were hungry and they were thirsty. I'm going to use some peas here to kind of help you grab hold of this. Poverty. They were in a place of poverty. They were in a place of, of needing something. They, they were hungry. They were in wastelands. They, they, they were in a place where there was no food or, 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 or sustenance to be able to help them. They didn't have a place to settle. It's a terrible time to get in a place when you can't settle. When the hurricane hit two years ago today, two years ago today, they were people dislodged from their place of dwelling. They were people that have, had to move out of our city. There were people whose homes were uninhabitable, and they were in a wasteland for just a brief period. And the issue here is, is when this thing happens, when life happens to you like that, the Scripture is there's an answer, and then there's a response to the answer. The answer is found in verse 6, where it says, Then they cried. The answer is, is, it always hits me. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Do you know how I find that God puts us in a, he puts us a, he puts you in a fix to fix you. He puts you in a place so that you have to understand you cannot live life without him. You can run through and think, I got this. Out. But eventually, poverty might hit. Eventually, a plague may hit. Eventually, there are problems going to come over your life. And you got a choice to make at that moment. And my, 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 I'm telling you, 3,000 years ago, here was the choice that they made. They cried unto the Lord in their voice. They cried out and God heard them. And delivered them from their trouble and out of their distresses. There was something about that. The message says that then in your desperate condition, you called out to God. He got you out of the nick of time. There are times that I will get an email, a text or something, and somebody say, Pastor, I got trouble. I got this. I, I lost my job. I, I feel like I, I can't make it. And I'm smiling inside myself saying, just a little bit more. Because I ain't your answer. Amen. Your answer is going to be crying out to the Lord. Your answer is going to be able to reach out to him and watch and see what happens. He put your feet on a wonderful road, and he took you straight to a good place to live. Let me tell you, you know what my prosperity, let me just be honest. God prospered me when I got born again. He gave me a plan. He gave me an idea. He gave me vision. He, he gave me ideas of churches. And all of a sudden, my whole life began to expand. There's something about being connected to God and realizing, you know, as long as I, and, and listen, in poverty, when I use the word poverty, honestly, none of us are in poverty. But pessimism can be a spiritual poverty. You can be wealthy and have a terrible attitude. Amen. Your attitude can see, you'd be so pessimist. You know what pessimism is? It's negativity. It's always negative. Watching the news and seeing negative things. Seeing they, every, always seeing the bad side of it. Man, 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 man was always negative, always upset. Old, old fella, old bird hunter. And, and he heard about a guy that had a dog. So he went out with this guy and his dog. And he said, I heard your dog is a special bird dog. And the guy said, absolutely special bird dog. He said, well, I don't believe it. He said, I've had lots of bird dogs. Them bird dogs ain't no good. They'll drown. They'll, they'll drop the bird in the water. They won't go get I don't believe it. He said, I'm telling you, this is a special bird dog. He said, what do you mean? How, how special is he? He said, well, come on out with me. And he started, quack, 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 quack. And all of a sudden, here come the ducks flying in. And as they come in, boom, 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 three shots, three ducks hit the ground. As soon as they hit the water, that dog took off out on the water walking on it. Walked right out on the water. Grabbed one of them birds, stuck it under this paw. Grabbed another bird, stuck it under this paw. Stuck the other one in his mouth. Came back to his owner. Dropped all three birds down and looked up at his owner. The, the old man, the pessimist, looked at him. He said, mm. he threw his gun down. He said, you know, the truth is, I wasn't on a bird dog that couldn't swim. 
Some people just can't see the blessing in life. They, they're so poor in their mind. They're poverty thing. Our response is, so thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle mercy to the children he loves. In other words, they found prosperity. They found peace. They found blessing in their life when they cried unto the Lord. Everybody say, cry it out. Cry out. He loved us out of prison. Oh, he loved us out of prison, loved us in prison. Psalm 107, verse 10, again, 3,000 years ago. He's, and, I'm, and I'm speculating on about the time of this. But some said in darkness and utter darkness, prisoners suffering in iron chains because they rebelled against God's commands and despised the plans of the Most High. Why are you in jail? I rebelled against God. Why are you in prison? I rebelled against God. So he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled, and there was no one to help. The one thing that we understand through the Word of God is you can be in prison and be free and be in, in the world and be in prison. I said you can be in prison and be free and be in the world and be in prison. What affects that is what? Your attitude. When I was uh, incarcerated, I had my attitude was shifted to the point was God put me here for a reason. I'm going to preach the gospel while I'm here. I'm going to lead an example. I'm going to be the best guy I can. Well, I, you know, cause I, so I had a sentence and I had to serve it out for uh, 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 unlawful uh, uh, breaking the law. Of, you know, because the bottom line is, you know, if they want to kill babies, they're just going to kill babies. But I said no. And so we, a bunch of us ended up in jail. You know the story. And, uh, but I'm saying that for those that are new. So you don't think, why was he in jail? <laughs> That's a good question. Why were you in jail? <laughs> okay, all right. Now come back to the preacher here. Stay with me. So they sat in darkness. And again, in other words, what I'm saying to you is I have friends that are incarcerated. I have friends that are in jail. I know that. They, 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 got, they rebelled against God. Certain things happened. Some was an accident. It, it, it just happens. Sometimes it just happens. So there the attitude has a shift. So he says, so he subjected them to bitter labor. They stumbled and there was no one to help. There is such a need to have a breakthrough from the prison of addiction. When you've got to have the pill, when you've got to have the drink, when you've got to have the look, when you've got to have these certain things, we, when we can get so addicted, so many things, they imprison us. They, they, they hold us back. The prison of unforgiveness, that, that you, are, you have incarcerated yourself by allowing somebody else to own you because you refuse to forgive them. And when you refuse to forgive somebody, they own you. You're in the jail. And the scripture says they cried out. They cried out to God. God, I need help here. I, I need something to go on. God has this way of humbling the arrogant. If you get puffed up, get ready. God's going to knock you back down. He always lifts up the, the humble and he puts down the arrogant. He just, that's who God is. I, I use a, a term, healing afflictions. I found out in Psalm 119, David said, before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I obey your word. <laughs> before I was afflicted, I went astray. I did my own thing. But now that I got my butt whooped, yeah. Come on, I'm back in the house. Come on. Amen. I'm serving God. I'm, I remember what it was like out there, so I'm coming back to serve him. And listen to me. There is an affliction waiting for anyone that just wants to run off from God. Because, and David's used this term. He said, look, and, and I meet people say, everything's going to be all right. You name it, claim it, blab it, grab it, uh, you know, uh, believe it and, and receive it. All that. I understand that. That's good preaching. But the bottom line is, if we rebel against God, if we turn away from him, affliction is waiting on us. And he's going to drive us back to him. You're the same way as a parent. There are times your kids run off. You saw them. You got to switch after them you run them back to the house you put a boundary around them for them that was important for their security and safety in life god does the same thing in our life you never get too old that god can't afflict you just a little bit and i know there are people saying well god don't god don't send this god we'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute i'm not all sure about some of this but sometimes it hurts before it heals sometimes it hurts before it heals at times we got pain it's hurting but there's healing coming after there's nothing like the feel of heal. There's nothing like the feel of heal. When you start getting healed, oh, it feels good. When that wound starts healing up and gets a nice scab on it, you start scratching a little bit, oh, that feels good. <laughs> There's nothing like the feel of heal. When, 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 you, when that healing starts taking place in your body, it just feels good. Hey, man, when, when, when you're well, sluggish and all of a sudden now the fatigue is gone and the energy's back in you, oh, it feels good. When you get your breath back, it feels good. 
Amen. It feels good to get healed up. So again, they cried unto the Lord in their trouble. He saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death. And he break their bands in sunder. And, and I know when you read that term break, what's that break their bands in sunder? Uh, in, in, in the message it says it like this. He shattered the heavy jailhouse doors. He snapped the prison bars like matchsticks. Have you forgotten who God is? Have you got forgotten his love for you? And I mean, that he can snap them. And again, we see it in the New Testament in the book of Acts where Paul's in prison and God, they begin to praise him and God comes in and shakes that prison and the doors pop open. There's nothing he can't do. Amen. When you cry out to him. And the Bible says they that hunger and thirst after right things are going to get filled. So the issue is my healing, my prison deliverance, all these things in my life, that they can take place if I'm after him. Many times in this house, we don't pray a lot. We don't do a lot. We just have church and go on out of here. But it's going to be up to you to how much hunger you got. Don't wait on the preacher to tell you you got to pray. Amen. You got to decide, I'm praying. Amen. I'm crying. I'm believing God for it. I don't have to have a permission slip to do this. I'm hurting on the inside. I've been in a prison of addiction. I've been in a prison of, and I'm telling you again, it will break. God wants us free. Amen. Amen. He wants us free for a reason. Because if it doesn't break, and I'm going to use this word lightly, plague. I'm working the P's here. But it says here in Psalm 107, 17, fools because of their transgression. And because of their iniquities are afflicted. They're so abhorreth all manner of meat, and they draw near to the gates of death. Now, I know in this PC environment we're in, we're not supposed to call people fools. I remember when I was young, I'm talking like 15, 14, 15 years old, somebody had read the Bible in my family and read the verse that if you call somebody a fool, you're going to hell. You ever heard this? You're, you're in danger of damnation and fire. They pulled that New Testament because I, I think it was my brother. I think I called him a fool, and he had a little bit of Bible in him, and he said something back to me like that. You can't call somebody, but you're going to hell for that. Now, that would make you nervous when you're little, when you realize, so I, don't, I can't call nobody a fool. And then I read the Bible, and the Bible calls them fools. Okay, hold on. So the Bible said you call them fool, you're going to hell, damnation and fire, but, if I, but, if I, but the Bible called them fools. So, I, 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 so this is where... You got to exegete. That's the word. That break it down. You got to see what it's really saying. And in the English, there's a fool. There's there's several fools. There's the bullheaded fool, stubborn. You know what I'm doing? I'm blowing steam out my ear. You seen the bull? Bullheaded, stubborn. You know, some of you think stubborn is a spiritual gift. Stubbornness is not a spiritual gift. Stubbornness is the sin of witchcraft. It's manipulation. Don't be stubborn. Be pliable in the hands of God. Do what God says. Don't say that. You say, oh, I'm so proud of Junior. He's so stubborn. He needs a good whooping. <laughs> that stubbornness is not a good thing. Amen. The other fool is pig-headed. That's it. That's it in the book of Proverbs. Bull-headed. Pig-headed is the sloth. Slow, lazy, procrastinating, school started, fool, laying in the bed, not getting up, not going to work, and wondering why they ain't got nothing to eat. Now, you can't sugarcoat it because those are the fools. Now, the other, the other fool is the one who rejects God. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. That's why April 1st is the atheist holiday. Uh huh. Okay, you'll get that later. Somebody help you out with that. So, again, out of the message, some of you were sick because you lived a bad life. Your body's feeling the effects of your sin. You didn't stand the sight of food so miserable you thought you'd be better off dead. And I'm going to say this, and it's going to offend some of you, but you're going to get over it or you'll find another church. We've all brought sickness into our bodies by our lifestyles. Whether it be nicotine, caffeine, alcohol, Drugs, how we have lived, what we've ate, what we should have ate and didn't eat, how we took care of ourselves. And we are in a situation where 
we have diabetes, we have heart failure, we have cholesterol. Some of us were born with a DNA that said, you're going to get, uh, you're going to get this. If you... yeah, that's why they go back and look at it. And yet we just ignore it and we keep living any way we want. And so the scripture looks at us and yells at us, fools because of their transgression and because of their iniquities are afflicted. Their soul abhorreth all manner of food, now, uh, all manner of things. So the bottom line is this, you got to own it. You got to own it. I told my pastor on the phone, I said, Pastor, you're hurting my feelings. You have lost 20 pounds in the last month. You just got in a new suit so you could go do an old suit so you could go do a wedding. And he laughs at me, and you didn't hear this part of the conversation. The reason I did is I had a, almost had a heart attack. I almost died. I was afflicted. I cried out to the Lord, and now I'm eating lettuce and chicken. If I'm going to be around for my grandkids, i got to change the way I've been living. Now, Pastor, I don't like you. You're rebuking me with your lifestyle. But I understand it. i got, I got to shift some things. And we all go, how many of you know we all do this? We, we, we get our stuff right, and we're doing good. And the next thing you know, we're going down. And we need somebody to speak into our life. We need the Word of God to talk to us and say, look at us say, hey, you're being foolish. You're being foolish. You've got to take care of yourself. Now, the great thing about God is he is compassionate. He's, and so he says, I know you screwed things up. I know you've ran a life of recklessness. I know you've done whatever you wanted to do. But listen to me. If you cry out to me, I'll deliver you. I'll take care of everything that, that the body has been ate up, your bad liver, your messed up kidneys, your slowed down heart. I'm going to bless you. But listen to me. After I do that, do the best you can to get your own self together. What is good preaching? People need a voice of good news. And they need compassion from us. Here's the bottom line. Our diseases already condemn us. Oh, we'll point fingers at people with AIDS. We'll point fingers at people with all kind of different uh, sexual diseases. We'll point, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Listen, their disease is already condemning them. What they need is somebody to love them like God loves them. They need somebody to put an arm around them and say, it's going to be all right. We're going to come on out of this thing. Amen? We're not going to stay this way. Our response, so thank God for his marvelous love, for his miracle mercy to the children of God. Offer thanksgiving, sacrifice. What are you saying is testify. Testify. Testify about the goodness of God in the land of the living. Tell somebody, that was me. I was afflicted. I was down. I was in prison. I was in poverty. All the things for me. But I'm going to tell you something. I cried unto the God. He set me free. He helped me. He pulled me out of. So, so I'm not, guess it, preacher not being mean to you. I'm not, I'm really not. But I can't just back away from this. I'm telling you, I'm talking to me. Y'all just get to sit in on it. Hey, man, I'm talking to me. I know that, that as, as I get older, I, I think about, I want to go to heaven. I want to get connect with my friends. But I got to stay here because I got my kids. I got my grandkids. I got y'all. God, you, you're going to have to figure this thing out. So I got to leave it in his hands. My life, my times are in his hands. I have an expiration date, but I won't look at the bottom of my foot to see what it is. Matter of fact, my age, I can't get my foot up that high anyway. <laughs> Last point. And I'm going to use this word P for pilgrims. Pilgrims. Look what it says here. They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters. That's why it gave me the idea of the pilgrim. These see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raises up the storm. God raises up the storm wind, which lifts up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunk man and are at their wit's end. You ever stayed a night at wit's end? You ever been at wit's end? Y'all, some of the young people looking at me and be like, what in the world? You at your wit's end. You need to Google that one when the church is over. But you at the end. And it says, and I have been out on the seas. Not far. I, I'm the guy that watches Deadliest Catch and don't want to go there. <laughs> but I see the ship go up and down. I've heard people tell me, I went out fishing out in the ocean. Pastor, all I did was lose my lunch. 
I mean, it just I just could not handle the ups and the downs and the waves. And some of you, you, you love them cruises because that boat's so big and 10 stories high and you don't feel it. But, but every now and then, amen, they're going to send you out there with a hurricane. Uh-huh. They're going to send you out there. I ain't going. If I go anywhere, I'm going to Alaska, but I ain't going out there to play around in any, out in the Gulf. I didn't see too much trouble. Up and down. Life is up and down. See, it doesn't say that they got poverty. It doesn't say they got plague. It doesn't say that, that they got anything else wrong other than their pilgrims. The, the word pilgrim is a person who journeys to a sacred place for a spiritual reason. They're believers. These are pilgrims. They're on a pilgrimage. And in our life, we're on a pilgrimage. We're moving through. Pastor, I don't have, I'm not, I haven't been in no prison. I haven't been negative. I not, don't have no addictions. I, I don't have no plagues. I, I don't have no poverty. Yeah, but you're a pilgrim. You're up. Life has been up. And no, no, your life has been good, but you had kids. They helped you. But the ups and the downs. You staggered like a drunk man. You had wits in. You don't know what else to do. What else am I going to do with all this? It's crazy. The longer I live, the, the mess your life is getting for those around me. I'm just in the ship. I'm going to and fro. The Bible says same answer. When things are going, when, when your life is good, but everybody else around you is up and down, and you are, and it forces you to go up and down, you get caught in the whirlwind of it, you got to cry out to the Lord. And the scripture says they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out of their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper. The waves of the sea were hushed. They were glad when it grew calm, and he guided them to their desired haven. Listen to it in this message. When you called out to God in your desperate condition, he got you out in the nick of time. He quieted the wind to a whisper. He put a muzzle on the big waves. And you were so glad when the storm died down and he led you safely back to harbor. Sometimes life is like a big storm. And he, shh, shh wind, hush up. He muzzles it. It's, it's the same thing in the book of Mark when Jesus is in the boat sleeping. And the disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee and the storm comes up and the water starts tossing the boat around. And they get scared and they go wake him up and say, Master, don't you care? We're going to drown. And Jesus gets up and says, peace, be still. That's why when we sing that song, Jesus is God. Some of you just kind of cringe because you, you got that Son of God thing working in your head. But you forget that this Trinity, this Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. All this is a glorious mix-up. But the Bible says he's Emmanuel. He's God with us. And when he stood on the bow of that boat and he said, peace, be still. And he muzzled the water. He calmed down. And if you read that scripture in Mark, it says, and there were many little ships on the water. Sometimes all we're concerned about is our problem. But we forget that the storm that's around us is affecting everybody else. And when God calms your storm, he calms everybody's storm around you. If mom can just calm down, the kids can calm down. If daddy can get his stuff together, the kids would be a lot better off. Amen. If we can start calming this thing down, just calm down. They cried unto the Lord, Lord, help! We're going to drown! Shh! Peace! Be still. Amen. If you are really wise, Psalm 107, 43. Verse 43. It's the last verse of Psalm 107. If you are really wise, you'll think this over. It's time you appreciate it. God's deep love. If you're wise. What's the opposite of fool? Wisdom. Wise. If you're wise. He starts out talking about the fool. But he ends with wisdom. If you're wise, you're going to think this over. It's time you appreciate. Give God thanks for his good love. His deep love. It's deep. When I was in poverty, his love pulled me out. When I was in prison, his love got me through. When I had plague, his love delivered me. Amen. And as a pilgrim moving to my, I'm so, listen, we're still so, you say, well, I found my home. No, you didn't. You found a church in Crosby. But you ain't home yet. Right. Sister Ann got home. We ain't home yet. We just visiting this planet. Pastor's on fire. I said we just visiting this planet. Yeah. Amen. I, I, I love this place. 
but I ain't going to go hug no tree. <laughs> Unless I'm climbing it to shoot a deer. Right. <laughs> Hallelujah. I'm just visiting here. First John 4, and I'll close with this. Verse 7. First John 4. Go back to the book of Revelation, back up a couple books. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who, know, who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because the very essence of who God is is love. There, there's, there's an old song that says, He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. There's something about Look that song up on the way there. It's Dallas home. Uh, but the song has the fact that, that through plague and poverty and prison, the, the, the passion of God, the love of God was to keep us, draw us out. He not mad at you. He not upset with you. But he'll afflict us. He'll afflict us to get us back to him. He knows best. Dad knows best. Amen. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Verse 9, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we so ought to love God. Testify. Testify. Stand with me. Without love, all I say is ineffective. Without love, all I know is incomplete. Without love, all I believe is insufficient. Without love, all I give is insignificant. Without love, all I accomplish is inadequate. What we do has to be with love. How we've cared, how we've reached. I love this church. I'd soon preach here as anywhere else I know of. I mean, I, I was in a good place this week, but I love getting back here. I want to tell you, we, we understand each other's weaknesses. We, we know where we've been. But as people come through them doors, and they come through in poverty, and they come through in plague, they come through in prison, or they're just sojourning through life. Give them an opportunity to cry out to the Lord. Amen. And if you lead by example, if you lead by example, that's why the Scripture tells us to praise Him. Some of you have yet to crack your voice above the Cowboys winning, the Texans winning. I'm serious. The Astros winning. You get excited about that. But what about God delivering you Amen. from yeah. poverty, out of plague, out of prison, getting you a place in life? Come on, somebody in this house, give him a praise. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No more of the fool. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, give him praise. Lord, we thank you. But then let we cry out to you. Deliver us, remove us, strengthen us. And peace well in this house. Jesus' name. I five three people for you. Sit down and say, I got it. I got it. I got it. I got it. I got what he said. Sherman, high five somebody. I'm watching you. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. I got it. I got it. You ain't got to say it anymore, Pastor. I got it. You can be seated now. I got it. If I get our servant leaders, come on up here. I got it. Got a lot of folk on vacation today. Got a lot of people out of town. I think I counted almost 80 people 80 people that are normally in this church that are out of town this weekend so that that's it all right now we'll see what happens they didn't invite me i wasn't gonna go anyway amen i got a little something coming up the end of september sister laurie and i's anniversary coming up yeah. we're gonna fly out to utah and then i'm gonna sneak up to northern california preacher bob Oots, bishop bob Amen. Amen. So that's the end of September. We don't have to talk about that all right now.
But I, I give you a heads up when I'm going. Oh, by the way, while I'm gone, I'm going to bring Kenneth back in here to preach to y'all. How about yeah. that? Oh, it make him happy to know the three of y'all clapped about that. 